hurricane during a pandemic is double trouble. You have just the next few hours to prepare if you're along Florida's east coast. Florida's governor has declared a state of emergency. He's urging residents to have facial coverings and hand sanitizer as this potential disaster is merging with the COVID-19 crisis here. It's important that you start to include personal protection equipment in those packets, in those hurricane preparedness kits today. Right now on hand, they have 20 million masks, 22 million gloves, 10 million gowns, 1.6 million face shields. 270,000 coveralls and 20,000 thermometers. This is what has changed overnight since you went to bed. And we're not waking up to a stronger hurricane. Nothing has really changed a lot with the track either. More of a ragged system, a very lopsided storm. The track has shifted ever so slightly east, away from the coast. That's good news, but from strong winds to flooding rains to storm surge, it is especially a concern here along the coast of Palm Beach County. So Hurricane Isias, Isias, sorry. So Hurricane Isias, that's not Isaiah, that's not Isaias, it's Isias. Where they come up with these hurricane names, I'll never know. I've started following this as it was just a low pressure off of the coast of Africa. I posted an update to it to our community page the other day, just some images of, you know, the potential impact that it has along the east coast of North Carolina. And, you know, one of the things, the reason why I'm standing right here to explain this to you is uh, when it, just because a storm is in a category five or a category four, it could be large enough to cause uh, devastating flooding. And so uh, where I'm standing right now is actually up three stories from the bottom of the river down below. On days like today, we'd be out there swimming in this river, having a good time. There we go. Isn't this a life, Benjamin? Should I put this back in the water or should I just keep it? You put it back in the water. Let it live. Bye-bye. But after a hurricane, this river very quickly climbs up this dam. This dam that I'm standing on is actually, uh, as we drive by after a storm and we watch the floods rise, we can tell which roads in the area are going to be flooded based on the water height of this dam. And that's kind of a, all the locals know it. But they, they, they check the dam to know how high the water has gotten. And, you know, you can look at peak graphs and everything else. But if you don't have a visual in your community to know what that actually means, uh, it doesn't mean a whole lot to you. So uh, this dam that I'm standing on for a lot of us is an indicator of flooding. And we know that when it reaches a certain point along the side of the dam, um, the, the floodwaters have extended uh, through certain areas of the community and we know we can't reach certain roads. After Hurricane Florence, the water was actually all the way up to where I'm standing. Um, and when that happened, we were basically on an island for a couple days until the water went back down. I know for me, there are a lot of things that I need to get together before we get impacted by a hurricane. Um, it would take me at least a week's amount of time to get projects to the point where um, they, they would be secure for such an event. Uh, and, you know, I keep telling myself, I'm going to get to these before a hurricane gets around. And I've kind of fallen into the lazy summer attitude where it's 95 degrees outside and I don't want to go out there unless it's to water the garden at night. Uh, and even then, you know, my wife does that a lot of times. The gardens are her babies. Um, I take care of the cows and, and do, you know, a lot of the, the work projects around the house. So right now I'm kind of looking at this system and I'm saying, okay, well, this is something I need to watch. It could become a threat to the East Coast. So that means that I need to prepare and I need to start thinking about, you know, things that I need to do to be ready for the storm and start getting things done. And the difference between this hurricane season that's unique to every other hurricane season is that you definitely don't wanna be in a position in a pandemic where you and your family end up last minute having to go to a, a hurricane center, uh, an evacuation center where there's a lot of people uh, huddled into a building trying to um, make it through a storm. I mean, that's not, that's not gonna be the safest place for you. If you live on the coast, it might be a lot safer than staying in your home. But the reality is, is if you're planned ahead of time, you have a game plan, stuff like this shouldn't matter to you. Now I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about some of the things that could be helpful to you in a storm. It's going to be an active hurricane season. We started out with abnormal activity and then we went to an extreme period of time where there just wasn't a whole lot of activity in the Atlantic. A lot of that has, there's so many different models that affect our climate. And a lot of that has to do with um, a drier, 
conditions in the Sahara, which, you know, I, in one of my videos, I talked about uh, the multi-decadal Atlantic oscillation cycle cooling. That actually causes drought conditions in the Sahara. We got hit with a bunch of uh, Saharan dust for a while. That literally was drying up the air over us all the way through the 4th of July and beginning to mid July. And now we're kind of getting back into the swing of things without all that dust, without all that dryness. And, you know, it's starting to get real humid again. We're starting to get a lot more moisture in the air. We're starting to get better conditions for hurricane formations. And within the last couple of weeks, we've actually seen a lot of activity in the Atlantic, mainly in the Gulf. All that being said, let's look at some of the things that you can do to be a little better prepared. What I wanted to do is focus a little more less on you know giving you guys the the overall synopsis of why there are more hurricanes I, I think i've talked about grand solar minimum a lot the impacts that it has and you know what impacts the solar flare could have on a hurricane and it's more of a conversation that we might be able to have as the storm approaches and we get some better forecast models to work with uh, as i said right now it's just kind of all up in the air i know that we have been trending towards la nina which would indicate that we're trending towards a period of less wind shear. We are on the earliest eye storm named storm in, uh, re since we've been keeping records. Uh, so I think that that is significant when it comes to the storm. It's, we're definitely having a pretty active season. Now, as we head into the fall, as you can see with Isis and then Josephine potentially starting behind him, um, things are starting to pick up. So what I want to do in this video is, is talk to you a little bit more about hurricane preparation because I know for me, I've been sitting around just really kind of enjoying life and trying to beat the heat. I call it my lazy summer days. I kind of, I've, I completed some projects, you know, then we kind of got onto this, you know, path of taking the boat out. Um, going swimming down at the river and I've kind of put some things on hold uh, with this building I actually have a lot of work to do before I get hit with a tropical storm and so I have been I've ordered some wood to get the front porch on this thing so I can get the siding on the sides the wood was supposed to be here this morning it's now seven o'clock at night uh, you know it's funny with this pandemic how things change I was able when building the building I was able to get lumber faster than I am now and it was cheaper. Now it's more expensive than it was back then. I, I really don't know <laughs> the reason for that, but that seems to be the case. And, uh, you know, I've been waiting all day for this lumber load to get started and it still hasn't arrived. Anyway, so what I wanted to do is talk to you guys about some of the things that going through my kit that I have that, you know, aren't things that I think a lot of people think of when they think of a hurricane but I was gonna to describe to you why I have them in our kit and, and how they're useful to me. I have talked a lot in the past about these Midland two-way radios, and I would definitely suggest you get yourself some two-way radios. They have a great weather alert system on them, uh, which is more reliable than any phone system that you have. Just for having something that's going to give you a fast alert system, these radios are great. But I would also, when you get these, establish a line of communication with your neighbors on a two-way radio system so that when there is a big storm coming through, you have um, a method of communication with others around you so that you can be in touch with them. Uh, a lot of times, cell phone signals can be very wishy-washy during storms, especially after storms if towers get uh, blown down. And so two-way radios could end up being the form of communication in a really bad storm that uh, is a lifesaver to you. It's a lifeline to other people. I also have right here is a Sun Life solar powered radio with a hand crank. Um, and this also has a flashlight on it, I believe. Yeah, it's up front. The battery is not charged. Something that I have found with some of these inexpensive radios like the Sun Life radio, um, the frequency isn't really all that great. Uh, I don't get a lot of channels on it unless it's fully charged. It does have a spot for batteries, so you can have a spot for your batteries and, and, and 
have fresh power on it, but the, the reason why I have this is because it can charge via solar energy and it can charge via hand, hand crank. And if I absolutely had to, I could sit there and crank this for a while and be able to get um, news over the radio as well as use it as a flashlight. Um, it's just a handy thing to have. They're, they're less than $30, these Sun Life ones. In a, in a dire emergency, something like this is, is a fantastic tool. I have taken this different places, tested it out. Um, it won't stay charging when you're using it off of the, the solar panel alone. You pretty much have to leave it out in the sun all day for it to charge off of the solar panel, and it doesn't replenish it fast enough to keep the radio on for long periods of time, but it will last for several hours. Uh, building our building, I had it out here playing music for several hours, and then once it lost charge, I didn't, um, it, it wasn't as effective, obviously. And it, you know, taking it out to the beach, I didn't feel like it had a super strong radio signal. Again, a lot of the radio signal of these, these are very basic radios, is gonna depend on how much of a charge you have on the batteries. With a two-way radio, you're gonna get weather communications, you're gonna be able to communicate with other people. If you feel like you need to be able to hear the news, which is important to most of us, having something like one of these emergency radios that can be powered off of solar power, powered off of hand crank, they're a good thing to have in your emergency kit. So again, that's only about 30 bucks. These radios here will cost you about $50. The other thing that we have is we have a lot of different candles that we keep in our emergency kit. I have some candles that have kind of the, the metal base. You can light these candles in these bases and, and they're gen generally safe. We also have some loose candles that we can put on plates and things. Now, when we got married, my wife and I, years ago, we had a lot of candles at our wedding. And we, it was, we had them all in these glass jars. And they, we use these the most in emergencies when our power goes out for an extended period of time. These are what we use and we've replenished them with different colored candles over the years. This is just a red candle from Christmas. We can light these and let them burn for a long period of time. They're protected in the glass and so, and they put off a lot of light. The glass also helps project the light around the room. So if you are able to, I would definitely get something like this that you have in a closet in your house. Uh, we have a ton of these and when, it, when the power goes out, we're able to just kind of light up the house with them. But if you don't have the money to invest in something like that, definitely get yourself some smaller candles. When it comes to lighting something like this, I prefer to use long matches or a long lighter, um, but with these smaller candles, a cigarette lighter will suffice. So make sure that you have some sort of lighting source with your candles uh, when you do this. Back here, I also have a little battery operated candle for those of you who um, can't have candles because uh, uh, your landlord doesn't allow it. Uh, these work pretty well, you just pull your little tab out and the candle lights up and they last, a, they have a decent amount of energy. Um, my wife often puts these on the backs of our toilets after a storm where there's a power outage so that um, there's always kind of a night light in the bathroom. So it's a good alternative to candles if you need to be able to have a bunch of lights that you can spread out around your house. Definitely would recommend that. So another big thing when it comes to lighting is having a flashlight. Um, a lot of you have probably heard of the EDC flashlights. These are everyday carry flashlights. This is a light that I particularly like made by Olight. It's nothing special. It has about 15 lumens on the, the low setting and the high setting has about 300 lumens. It, well, it has 300 lumens for about three minutes and then it drops down to 150 lumens. It, it, it has a special capacitor in there that allows it to take a AA battery and have just an incredible light and I love these lights because they have a clip. You can put them on, on your hat and you can use them pretty much as a headlamp. Uh, just a great overall hardy light. Very, very nice construction quality. A light like this is probably gonna cost you about $30, but you can put these in your pocket, walk around with them. Um, great things to have. Olight also makes some tactical lights. This is called the Warrior X Pro. I'll do a separate review on these lights because again, this is a fantastic light. This light is extraordinarily bright. It's the brightest flashlight I have ever owned. And for somebody who lives on a farm, if you need to be able to head out into a field to check on animals immediately following um, a hurricane or during the eye of the storm when it calms down for a bit, you need to run out and check on everything. This light 
I can see all the way across our pastures with this light and find anything I'm looking for within minutes. When I turn this on, it's like daylight back there. And again, I'll do a separate review on this light. This is a much more expensive light, but if you if you have the money and you live on a farm and you or a homestead and you need to be able to see a lot of things all at once, um, this is a fantastic light. I, I'm not too pleased with the tactical features of it, but I am very pleased with the performance of it. This is about a 15 acre field and I can see I can, I can light up the tree line on the back side of it with this little flashlight. It's pretty impressive. It does get pretty hot, and when it's hot, it glows, so you know that the surface is hot. That's a pretty cool feature, too. 300 lumens. It's bright enough for, you know, backyard use. But then 2250, boom. It's almost like daylight back there. Okay, and again, this is 300 lumens, 2250. So, you know, with the 300 lumens, I can see a lot. It's, it's kind of like a regular flashlight. It's actually brighter than our mag light that we have inside our house. Our mag light is probably somewhere around 150 lumens. It's nothing compared to what this one does. But when you turn this thing on, you can see clear as day. Really, pretty impressive difference in, in visual. And again, that's the 300 lumens. Um, now the, the, the smaller light that I showed you guys earlier that I use as a headlamp in some cases, let me get that out. Uh, you guys probably can't see anything I'm doing here. I'm digging in my pocket. So this is the Olight i5T EOS. This is your everyday carry light. And again, it's supposed to be 300 lumens on the second setting. It's a, the, the, the throw is less defined, um, but it is a pretty bright light. And then the regular setting, this is about 15 lumens. And you know, th this is probably what I'm most used to with our old mag lights, um, or maybe this right here, but, uh, this is the 300 lumens on the uh, Warrior X Pro. And again, 1500 lumens, just bright as day. Thank you, Winter, for peeing right there. It's pretty nice of you. So an impressive difference. I'll do a bigger review on this. Um, when I have a little more time, I'll fly the drone up so you can see how far that throw actually is. Hey, can I borrow that flashlight? Which one would you like? Would you like the 300 lumen everyday carry light or would you like the 2250 lumen? Just point that towards the peak so I can get the edge. Sure. Now we've actually used the Warrior X Pro for candling. And I'll, I'll do a video on that. Uh, Shauna does a good job explaining what we're looking for when we're candling. But um, because it's so bright, <laughs> you can easily put an egg on it and see what's growing inside the egg. Even in daylight, you can see uh, the inside of an egg when you're trying to candle it. So we like this flashlight. It's probably, it's become my favorite flashlight. Price point's a little high. And again, the everyday carry Olight is something that I always have in my pocket. Now this is just a light that's in our emergency kit. Um, it does have a battery operation, but in case you run out of batteries, you can squeeze it and it lights up. Now, um, this is just something, I don't know where we got it from, but we threw it into our, our kit because it can operate without a battery. You really don't need both of these because like I said, with this, this has an LED flashlight on it. This also has an LED light function down underneath the solar panel. Uh, it's got plenty of options for having a flashlight. So you don't need to have something like this. Of course, you can tell with this one, you have to hand crank it for a little bit. This one might be a little easier uh, if this is not charged, but put batteries in this, you should be fine to go and, and easily charge it up when you need to. We also have a lot of light sticks. We have some for the kids that the kids would like to enjoy uh, because when things go dark, when, when you're in a hurricane 
and the lights go out, there's there's no light pollution in the in, in the sky to help light things up around you. It can be very, very dark, especially with clouds in the sky, with nothing to reflect off of the clouds. So uh, having this type of stuff, these type of lights is um, is essential in, in, in a situation like that. We also have, this is just an example of a first aid kit. We actually have a much larger first aid kit. I don't know where it is. My wife uses it to patch me up. Uh, this is just something I had out in the shop for quick stuff. And um, you wanna have some ponchos on hand if you can. Uh, most of us, when we go into a hurricane, have a, have a rain jacket on hand. But if you have your emergency kit with you with these ponchos in it, um, it'll get you by. Now, when it comes to food and water, we have some of these emergency rations. And we also have plenty of food in our storage in our house, but these are less likely to get damaged. So this is like a severe case where we need to have calories and we can't get anywhere else. Um, it's not a bad thing to have some sort of military food preserved in your house for, um, for long durations of time. We also have iodine tab tablets. Now this is something I'm probably gonna order new ones of. I don't know what happened to my cap there. It's kind of gotten corroded and messed up. But iodine tablets are good. Even if you're on a well, um, water can get contaminated very quickly after a storm. So iodine tablets are essential. We also have a life straw. I haven't even opened this. This is a personal water filtration system. It says it removes 99.999% of bacteria, filters up to a thousand gallons. Now something like this is good for individual use, but if you're trying to get a lot of water for a family, I feel like this is gonna be fairly limited, but I, th I think you know, having a life straw is an inexpensive water filtration system for emergencies that anybody can have on hand. And if we absolutely had to, uh, we could pass this around in our family and, and get enough water to, uh, to survive in a lot of different situations. So those are different kind of emergency food options that you can have. Now I will say that we also have on our insurance policy, a $500 policy on the food in our fridge and our pantry so that when a storm hits, if power goes out, our food is insured and we can get that replaced. Now this is a Sun Life generator. I have kind of a love hay with this generator. If you've watched a lot of my past videos on hurricane preparation, I've shown you a, a standard generator that you can get at Lowe's. They're relatively inexpensive, a couple hundred bucks, less than a couple hundred bucks for a, a decent little generator that can power your fridge, and kind of power some of your emergency needs if your power goes out. This is different. This, when they, when they call this a generator, it's not going to be able to power a fridge. It's not going to be able to power, it says it can power uh, tools, yeah, it says uh, phone, computer, tablet, camera, electric tool, floodlight. Um, they have a drone on there and they say it's good for camping. So let me tell you what this can do and what this can't do. Cause I've tested this on a lot of different tools. I actually have hooked it up to power tools. I did not have uh, very good luck with power tools.
I did, it did work on the, on the boat buffer, but again, I wasn't applying any pressure to it. I'm sure it would have eventually shorted it out. Um, I've tried it on generator, uh, um, air compressors. I've tried it on a lot of different things. It will power things like a fan. Uh, I, I hooked it up actually to a battery charger or trickle charger to see if I could get uh, some charge on a battery in the event that I'm out in the boat. be able to get you know 10% back onto it get it up to 80% and get the boat to turn over so it does have some capabilities in that capacity now our power did go out while we've had this and I plugged it into because our internet has a backup battery but it doesn't provide battery power to the modem so I've got our portable generator here from Sun Life and it's plugged in. I just have the Wi-Fi plugged into it right now. The Wi-Fi is over here. So you can see that's working. And so we were able to turn on the modem and have access to the modem. We were able to power the TV off of it. And so even with the power out for an extended period of time, uh, this thing supplied us with power to operate our internet and have you know entertainment uh, very easily for several hours on end. So it definitely has some capabilities. And I think it's important when, when communications go down, see we're on fiber, so that's buried under the ground. It, really, it takes a lot for our fiber network to go down, but the modem goes out. So having something that you can put inside your house and plug some of those electronics into is actually a great tool to have. And again, like we've taken this out on boats, we've taken it to the beach with us, we've used it to charge uh, cell phones. It's got a lot of ports for charging cell phones. Your whole family could have phones on there charging all at once. And you know, it, it's a fantastic tool for that. You can charge your computer, you can get onto a computer. Um, it has all sorts of different DC uh, outputs for, for charging small DC uh, pieces of equipment. It also has a flight, a light on the back side. So this operates as another flashlight for you. You can put it into a strobe mode for an emergency situation. So I like the fact that it has some of those emergency features on there. It's another light source for us and um, it's a power source. So, you know, things like this O-light here actually power off of a magnetic um, USB cord and you can plug that in turn it on and it'll charge the light. These are fantastic little generators. They're basically lithium batteries that you charge up, you plug them into the wall to charge them up and they hold a charge for quite some time. I haven't charged this in a long time, but if I, if I wanted to use it, it's, it'll work for um, a while. You could also get a solar charger kit for these so you can charge them off of solar power. But like I said, they're not gonna power they don't replace the need to have a big generator. The reason why I'm showing this to you guys is because not you know just for the reasons that I just said, but there are people that live in apartments. You can plug lamps into this. You can do a lot of things during a power outage that you wouldn't be able to do if you, if you can't have a gas power generator sitting outside with extension cords running to it. Again, you could take it camping if you're a luxury camper. You can take it on the boat like we do, uh, plug a fan into it so that when it's hot on the boat, you have airflow. I would not use power tools on this even if they start to work. I think you'll burn them out. And I wouldn't use this routinely on things with motors. Um, if you have to use it for short periods of time, I think you're fine. But I would use this more for electronics um, than I would for motors. An energy efficient fan is probably okay. But, you know, like I said, I feel a little iffy about the constant output of this to to the point where I, I wouldn't want something with a motor just constantly running off of it. And something else we always have on hand is, um, this is an all weather tough pad with some special pens. And then we also have a map, a road map, an old fashioned road map of our state. Uh, you, 
you need a way of going back to the good old fashioned ways. And this is a waterproof map. We can mark this up with these pens. We could write down directions on our pad. There are just a whole lot of benefits to having something simple like this in a hurricane survival kit. You can write down telephone numbers when you're talking to FEMA. Lord knows they're gonna give you about 100 different numbers after a storm that you're gonna to have to keep up with, 100 different contacts that you're gonna to have to keep up with. Um, having something like this that's gonna make it through a storm and still be usable for writing on, et cetera, is, is vitally important in my opinion. I'd also make sure that your phone is charged. If you have one of these, you'll be able to charge it um, and clear it of all its memory so you can get as many pictures before and after a storm as possible of your property for insurance reasons. Um, I also would recommend, especially these days, that you have a personal firearm. There's a lot of looters after hurricanes, and there are a lot of unsafe situations. It, it never hurts to have personal protection. Things that I would have on my person during a hurricane are probably this firearm. I would have uh, the Scandinavian four stacks, and I'll explain that to you in a minute. I would also have rope, and I'd have a pocket knife. And if you have one, a multi-tool, because a multi-tool pocket knife is gonna have more functions for you. When you have limited resources, having something with a lot of resources is better than having something with just a single type of resource. Why do I want to have an ax? Your purpose of having something like this is no different than a fireman having an ax when they try and get into a house on fire to get you out of it. I've had friends and neighbors who were inside a house the entire house around them came down. You know, they were in an interior closet of some sort. Whether you're helping a neighbor out or you need to get out of a house yourself, having something that will uh, allow you to help break apart pieces of two by four and other things to be able to crawl out of a situation is essential. So this is a Scandinavian forest ax. This is made by Grand First Brooks. I love this ax because this is a very powerful ax, a very sharp ax, and its size is very useful, especially if you're in a, in a tight spot trying to get out. So I would definitely recommend that you have something like this on hand. I also have a leather sheath made by um, Review Outdoor Gear. And this, this sheath is, is great because when things are happening, I could have it on my belt, it's with me. And then if I need to be able to uh, get through something, I can pull it out and get through it. Having your own tool to get out is essential. Now I also have and I would probably keep this near me as well. This is a splitting mall made by um, Grand First Brooks as well. It's the best splitting mall I've ever owned. I, I love their axes. I love everything that they make. Um, now on the back of this, it does have kind of a sledge, which is different than a lot of other splitting malls. They do make a splitting mall without one of these. Um, but this is also another useful tool to kind of whack through things if you had to. So I just wanted to give you guys some ideas of what you could use. In a, in a basic survival kit, this is right now, this is just stuff that I'm starting to get together and I thought I'd, hey, you know, mention it to you guys. This is, these are some good ideas for you to have on hand. Uh, if you don't have some of this stuff and you like what it is, that now's the time to, to order it. We're getting into the hurricane season. As a storm approaches, you'll start to see me take uh, different directions where I start filling bathtubs full of water, getting bottles of water, storing things, uh, uh, storing gasoline. When you store gasoline, you wanna make sure you're using a type one gas can or a type two gas can. So when it comes to gas storage, this is a type one uh, gas safety container. And basically it has one point of uh, filling and pouring. It comes with a funnel that you can put on there to, to pour the, the gasoline out so it doesn't go all over the place. Uh, a type two will have a separate fill spout and then it'll have another spout for pouring. The Type 2s will cost you around $100, whereas a Type 1, which has just one opening, will run you around 50 bucks or so. But these are, you can hear the, the air tightness when I first open that up. So when you put fuel in a container like this, it's gonna store really well, number one. Number two, it, no water is gonna get into this. Uh, this is not an easy handle to pull back. And number three, when it comes to fire suppression, uh, these these cans are superior. Uh, that's why they're called safety cans. They, they suppress fire. This one's got a dent on the side. Not too worried about that. But if you're going to be storing fuel, if you're trying to get fuel through a hurricane or a major storm, I would definitely recommend at a minimum a type one can. Obviously, if you can get yourself into 
the Type 2 cans, they're a little easier to operate than a Type 1. As far as safety and storing fuel, nothing beats this. The issue that I have with these is number one, with a lightning strike, I don't trust them. Uh, these cans are designed mainly for transporting fuel. They're not designed for storing fuel like a safety can would be. They do have some with safety spouts, but these things, these cheap plastic spouts, they, they break over time. Some of them don't even open properly after a period of time, so then you end up getting spouts like this that are just open. I, you know, I definitely would not trust these with a lightning strike, and when it comes to water, I've had a lot of fuel become contaminated in gas cans like this. Not just water getting in through here, but water seeping in through these cracks. I think one of these Probably, yep, this one right here. Already the seam is broken on it, so um, air and water can leak in through the top there and contaminate the fuel. These are only designed for transporting fuel to and from a gas station. This can here is designed for properly storing fuel. You don't want those gas cans exploding on you, but uh, there'll be, I'll throw out a whole bunch of ideas to you. I'll try and create a playlist on our channel as we get into the season that has more uh, tips of, of things because I know that when we're all in panic mode and we're trying to get ready, we don't think of everything and sometimes we wish we just had a checklist. I haven't put a checklist together personally myself. So as I kind of prepare for our, ourselves, I, I might throw out a few more videos. Uh, I'll reference this video as kind of some basics and um, you know, as as the season progresses, if, if I feel that we're in a a dire situation where we need to, to do more prep, I'll do a video on what we're doing so you can get an idea of that. Right now, I'm trying to just basically take an inventory of what we have. I'm trying to make sure that our larger generator is functioning. It never functions until I fix it each year. And then, you know, as these storms come in and they come in closer, I don't have to be spending time thinking about this stuff because I've got it all together. I'll be spending my time, you know, securing furniture, making sure that we have all of our immediate needs as, as the storm approaches. So now is the time, not to panic, but just to start thinking about the stuff. Make sure you have these things in place. You're not gonna find these things the week the hurricane approaches. Um, a lot of these things are gonna be gone off the shelves because these are things that everybody kind of looks at and says, oh, I need a two-way radio. I need a weather radio. I need candles, you know. So this is the type, of, this is the time to try and pull this stuff together now. So stay tuned. I'll give you guys some updates on some of these storms. And as they get a little closer, we'll start to talk about a little bit about some of the mechanics going on with them that's causing them to steer certain ways, causing them to uh, build or dissipate. Uh, and it's a good conversation to have so that people are aware of uh, what actually goes into hurricanes. It's not, it's, you know, it's not a global warming thing. So stay tuned and I'll talk to you guys soon.